My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to FOMO FOMO. Sapiens. This is season eight. Can you believe it? I can't. I really can't believe it. It's so nice. Season eight. And eight is a lucky number, auspicious number in China. At least I know that for certain. Probably some other places as well. I can't believe we're here in this eighth season. And I got to tell you, it just feels good to be back. Now, as you know, this is the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, FOMO Sapiens 24-7. How was your summer? Mine was fast and furious. I was working on some entrepreneurial projects that I don't I think I've worked harder in my life. I really put in the hours, but it was nice. And I did a little travel here and there. I went to Europe, spent some time at the ocean. I went to Colorado, spent a little time in the mountains. So it was a nice summer, but I am pumped to be back September is the best time of the year. I always like it. It's like first day of school, first day of FOMO Sapiens. And we are starting this season with a guest who I think is perfect for this show. His name is Jason Pfeiffer, and he is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, and he has a new book out called Build for Tomorrow. It's all about managing change, which is a topic that, of course, we all need to become experts in. We need to have that as one of our superpowers. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, Jason, as I mentioned, is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. He's also a startup advisor. He's the host of the podcast, Build for Tomorrow and Problem Solvers. And he has taught his techniques for adapting to change at companies including Pfizer, Microsoft, Chipotle, DraftKings, and Wix. He's also worked as an editor at Fast Company, Men's Health, and Boston Magazine. And he's written about business and tech for the Washington Post, Slate, Popular Mechanics, and others. And our conversation, we're going to really talk about, first of all, before we get into change, I just wanted to hear from the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine how he defines entrepreneurship. And it might be surprising. It may not be what you think. We also talk about how entrepreneurial thinkers can manage change because let's face it, change is constant, right? You've heard that saying? Well, it's true. And finally, we're going to talk about how you can structurally manage change. We're going to talk about it specifically with some examples. And we're going to talk about how you can get to the point where you accept change and look back and say, you know what? I'm glad that everything has changed. This is the place I want to be. That is the the place you want to get to at the end of this conversation. Now, in terms of my small ask, well, this is an easy one. Share the show with somebody you think would enjoy this content. The good news is if they start listening now, they can go back into the back catalog. I got seven seasons of content, and most of it is still pretty fresh and up to date. Some of the stuff, probably like deep pandemic stuff, you don't want to go back there. It's just slow, but so much good stuff. So check it out. Share, post on social media. Just get the word out there. I would be so appreciative if you would. All right. And now onto the interview. As you know, I always ask my guests the same question. And so I started my conversation with Jason asking him this. What's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? It was quitting my first job. And I will tell you, I can say I was quitting my first job. But at the time, it was scary and I was screwing up at that job. So let me just tell you about it because boy, it was really important. And the lesson that I learned about it shaped the way that I think about work. Mm. I graduated college. I knew I wanted to be a writer of some kind. I didn't know what kind. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I got a job at a tiny little newspaper in North Central Massachusetts called The Gardner News, Gardner, Massachusetts. 6,000 circulation. This was back then. I don't know what it is now. Serving, you know, a community of people that were not reading this newspaper. <laughs> Nothing was happening in the studio. It was uh, it was a little soul crushing, I have to be honest. And I, I was writing about the the middle school play, that kind of stuff. And after, after a year, I'll tell you, I became, I became kind of resentful of being there. Um, because I was like, I'm better than this place. I have these aspirations. I was ambitious. I have these aspirations of writing for these large publications, doing these things. And this is this tiny place. And, and, uh, you know, I'm too good for it. 
And, uh, you know, that turned me into a jerk. Let's just be, let's just be frank. That turned me into an, to not a pleasant person to work with. Um, and then my boss came by with this letter and it basically said, uh, get better at being here or get the hell out of here. And I realized a couple things as I digested that. Number one was, you know what? I think that I'm too good for this place. But if I was actually too good for this place, then I wouldn't be here. But I mm. am here because mm. I, I'm, I, I don't have the experience to be anywhere else. I, I have a lot to learn. And that was humbling. And then I thought, well, where am I going to learn it? I don't think that I'm going to learn it here. I don't think that this is my place. I think that I really want to go and write for the largest publications that I can. They will not take me seriously now. They will never hire me because I've written a great story about the middle school play. Like, right, like I can't sit around and say, I'm so good that everyone should just recognize it. I'm so good that this job should put me on their shoulders and and, uh, and parade me around the city. And I also uh, am not so good that somebody at a much larger publication is going to come to me and be like, kid, loved that story about the local diner. Come on down. You're our next White House correspondent. That wasn't going to happen. So I need to go to people. I need to humble myself. I need to learn. I needed to put myself in learning environments. And I needed to go to people instead of waiting for people to come to me. And so I quit. And I sat in my bedroom next to a graveyard, literally. I was living in Holden, Massachusetts, in a <laughs> dumpy apartment next to a graveyard. And I cold pitched. And I didn't know anybody. And most people didn't respond. And after about nine months of this, I started to get some traction, like nine months of rejection and it being ignored. And eventually I got, I got like a story in the Washington Post. I got a story in the Boston Globe, the Associated Press. And that joint, that, that dual experience of, of, of um, realizing that I had to learn things and I have to be okay with that, that I can't just walk around thinking my ambition alone is going to is going to allow me to accomplish things. Like I, I have to start from where I actually am, which at the time was like a kid that didn't have any experience or any connections and didn't really know what he was doing. And I also needed to do everything that I possibly could to put myself in front of people that could help me and work with me and shape the work that I do. I don't know about the Gardner news. I have heard of that Gardner news. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. But I'm from New England myself. But what? what I, okay, so that I, I have lived that story. I, a lot of people probably have done. I remember, you know, I came out of business school. I was like, well, I have the Harvard MBA. Like, I'm going to just kill it now. And I was in a job that I hated next to an office park in New Jersey. And it was I hated driving there. I hated the work. I didn't like my colleagues. And after three months, I took a nap under my desk one day. It was like mm. being in the movie Office Space. And I was, I had to humble myself too and say like, you know what? Nobody's going to hand you anything. Yeah. Figure out what you want. Go after it. I changed jobs three months later and found a job I really liked. And, you know, so that was, but it it, it is so interesting when we come out of school, we're like, we think we're such hot, you know what? Mm -hmm. And then the world shows us, number one, that maybe we, we didn't find the right job. Number two, that if we're not putting our full selves into our work that people don't respect us. And number three, that when you're not happy at work, you can become a massive jerk. Yeah, you really can. You and really can. And you can lose perspective. It's so you lose perspective of whose fault it is. You start, <laughs> to, you start to think that it's, it's work's fault. It's not work's fault. It's your fault. Yeah, so you better so do true. something about it. Yikesies. All right. So I just want to start before we get into your new book, Bill for Tomorrow. I am just because I have you here. Yeah. And you're the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. How do you define entrepreneurship, you, Jason Pfeiffer? And has that definition changed over the time you've been at the magazine? So funny you ask that. When I first became editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, 2016, people started asking me versions of that question. How do you define an entrepreneur? What do, what do you think entrepreneurship is? And at first, honestly, I was I was like, these people are testing me. <laughs> they are seeing if I belong amongst them. And then I came to realize, no, no, there are so many people in this world doing so many things, all using the word entrepreneur, that people are not exactly clear what it means anymore. And that can be annoying, I think, because any word that gets overused starts to lose its meaning. But I tend to think of it as a really 
good thing. And the reason for that is because I define entrepreneur like this. An entrepreneur is someone who makes things happen for themselves. And that doesn't mean in any particular kind of way. It doesn't mean that you have to start a company, though many people do. You could be an entrepreneur inside of another company. You could be an entrepreneur in your life. I think that the more time that I've spent with entrepreneurs, the more that I've learned that the thing that defines an entrepreneur is the way that they think about themselves and the problems that they face and the way in which they adapt to meet those problems. And it is an intoxicating way to think. It shapes the way in which you approach everything else in the world. And that mindset is worth celebrating. It's worth building an identity around. And so I love, it's funny, I, early on, I got this email from a kid in high school asking me for advice. And the advice was, what do I do with all the poser entrepreneurs in my high school who aren't real entrepreneurs? Which is just mm. so funny to think that entrepreneurship as a identity has reached a level where there are like warring factions in high school about who is a true entrepreneur. But you know what? Fine. Because ultimately, if people are ingesting the idea that you can go and build things yourself and that there are infinite ways to grow and scale, that there is an abundance mindset that can be that can be applied to pretty much anything in your life. I, I just think that's wonderful and it's worth celebrating. And I don't really care if people are too precious about the word as a result. FOMO. FOMO. You know, what you say, I love that kind of broad view. I had this conversation I found interesting recently mm. with a business school professor about, so my first book, The 10% Entrepreneur, the idea is 10% of your time, money, doing things on the side, you know, that where you can build this equity, building equity and stuff, not just freelancing, but the idea is try things out, maybe many things, build a portfolio that you take with you over your life. That's what I have done. Yeah. And so I was kind of floating the idea of like, could we turn this into a short course to expose business school students to the idea that entrepreneurship is not an all or nothing thing? Mm. And he said to me, well, but it's not entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is disruption and doing something that's never been done before. And I was sort of like, man, listen, I super love that and I appreciate you, but have you left your classroom lately? <laughs> because so many, look at our friend, Jack Dorsey. He's not my friend, probably yours, but like yeah. he is doing a million things. I mean, I think about you, you're, 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 you're an advisor to startups. I'm sure you get equity sometimes. Like mm -hmm. all of us can engage in flexible ways in entrepreneurship. Isn't just like quitting your job, putting it all on the line. So it, entrepreneurial thinking, it can be applied to all parts of your life. So I, I think that's super, I'm glad we're aligned on that. Yeah. You know, can I just say that, like that way of thinking that that you're describing from that professor, just reminds me of NIMBYs. Mm. Uh, so, you know, like so, like a NIMBY in a community, NIMBY not in my backyard. These are people who oppose any kind of development, and the reason that they drive me crazy is because generally the way that they operate is like I should be the last person through the door, right? Like I got here, and now it's time to freeze this community as I found it. Yeah. Uh, so that nobody else can come. And I feel like I feel like the same thing happens when people try to define something based on whatever they've done. Like that professor probably either was involved in some kind of disruptive company or something like there was something that that person did that that shaped their understanding of what an entrepreneur is. And they're like, only people who are like me get to use this word. And like, no, 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 no. The door is open and other people can and should come through that door and define it for themselves, too. One hundred percent. All right. So I do want to jump into talking about your new book, which is out now. Yes. Build for Tomorrow. Now, I'm going to ask you kind of an obvious question, but I do feel like it's important to give context to everybody because we've mm -hmm. all been through, We, I mean, everybody was around the last couple of years, but you know, why this topic and why now? Yeah. <laughs> so when I first became editor in chief, in addition to, I guess, asking me, what do I think the definition of entrepreneur is? Uh, the question people always ask me was, what are the qualities of successful entrepreneurs? What are the, mm. what are the things that drive success? And I, I, I didn't, I didn't have a good answer to that for, I don't know. You know, I mean, I just, I had just started and, and I'll be honest with you. Um, I, you know, I, my background is in media. I, I was an editor at lots of different magazines before getting mm -hmm. to entrepreneur. And, and at the start of this role in 2016, I thought of myself as a media guy. I don't anymore mm -hmm. because I've spent so much time with entrepreneurs that it has, it has changed the way that I think about everything, including myself. I'm happy to 
go into that. But anyway, so I, I, I didn't know, but I knew that I, I, sh- I should have an answer to this question. This is the thing that is on people's minds. I realized the reason why it's on people's minds is because they see me as a guy who talks to everybody and can match the patterns. And so I should be able to see what is the thing that connects all these really successful people. So I spent a lot of time mm-hmm. talking about it, thinking about it, years looking into this. And I came to this answer, which is that the most successful people are the most adaptable. But how? How are they the most adaptable? And it, it seemed it seemed like they, they were doing something. They were learning something. It wasn't something people were born with. It was a skill that could be developed. But until the pandemic, I didn't really have a great answer because the, the pandemic did this did this remarkable thing. I mean, right, it did all sorts of terrible things too, but it did this remarkable thing, which was that it caused everybody to go through the same change at the same time. And therefore, you could watch and see the people who adjusted and adapted, who evolved the way that they work and evolved their own lives and got it, got, got, I mean, ahead is not exactly the right word, but they got somewhere new and transformative. And there were other people who didn't. And I thought, what is the thing that is dividing everybody up? And I came to realize change happens in four phases. So I watched it. I watched it happen. Phase one, panic. Phase two, adaptation. Phase three, new normal, right? It's new comfort, new familiarity. And then phase four, wouldn't go back. That moment where you say, I have something so new and valuable that I wouldn't want to go back to a time before I had it. And the difference is that some people simply move faster through these phases than others. Everybody goes through it. Everybody everybody goes through it, Do right? Do not think that just because someone is massively successful, that they do not also panic at the sight of change. They do, but they have armed themselves with the mindset and the tools and the knowledge of how they operate in moments of instability so that they can move through it faster than others and get to that wouldn't go back moment faster. And that was the thing that I wanted to, like that finally became the answer to that question that people were asking me years and years ago. And it was so big that I, it was a whole book's worth of writing it down. It's so, I, I, I love this because you, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about like the early days of the pandemic mm-hmm. and I remember my panic time and I started reading Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. And you ever read that book? Uh, no, but I've heard, you gotta read I've heard, it. I've heard, I've heard it, it show up in these exact stories. Yeah. And it's one of these things where it gave me some of the tools to move through these more quickly than I might have done because mm-hmm. it's like eternal wisdom, right? And it's not a long book. Everybody should read it. But but it was it was for me like a guidepost. I didn't have your book yet because you know you hadn't <laughs> written it. Now yeah. I would just yeah. read your book. Forget Victor. <laughs> but let's yeah, well, talk about some of these. There's room for Victor <laughs> and I in this world. <laughs> there is. <laughs> let's talk about some of these things. So onset of a crisis, yeah. panic happens. Mm-hmm. To move to adaptation You know, what is the kind of person who's able to navigate that? And what are the tools that you can develop to do so? So there are a lot of them. I'm going to tell you one. It it actually reminds me of something that you were talking about a little earlier. Mm. So I have this philosophy about work. I call it work your next job. And it goes like this. In front of you, in front of me front of uh, everyone listening right now, we have two sets of opportunities. Opportunity set A, opportunity set B. Opportunity set A is everything that is asked of us. So if we have a job and we show up at that job, we have things that we have to do. There are things that people expect of us. There are tasks and performances and things we're going to get reviewed on. We have to do well at those things. That's opportunity set A. Do well, advance. Then there's opportunity set B. The things that are available to you, but that nobody is asking you to do. And that could be stuff at your job. That could be uh, joining a new team. That could be learning a new skill. It could also be things outside your job. You might like listening to podcasts and try making one yourself. Why not? Basically, it only costs a microphone. And I believe, and I have experienced myself, opportunity set B is always more important infinitely more important. And the reason for that is not because opportunity set A is unimportant. You have to do good at your job or you'll get fired. But if you only focus on opportunity set A, then you will only be good at the things that you are already doing. And opportunity set B is where growth happens. You don't need to know how it's going to happen. You don't need to know why it's going to happen. I, I think that once you create these opportunities for yourself, what you what you really do is you create 
option opportunities for a zigzag payoff. Uh, I, 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 I like to think of my my career journey, I'm sure you feel the same. I'm sure everybody listening can see some version of this themselves where in retrospect, you can look back at how doing this led to that, led to that, led to that, right? Like I did this thing and I learned that skill or I met that person and then it enabled me to do this other thing. And like, it makes sense, but it could possibly have been predicted. You can't plan for, I'm going to do this and learn this and it's going to open this completely random other door and then it's going to teach me this new thing. And yet the only way that we can create those opportunities. And those are the things that are going to zigzag you through change. Those are the things that are going to help you navigate so that when you know, you're like going down the street, I mean, just sort of like picture it, right? You're like going down a straight road and a giant boulder falls in front of the road. Now you can't go anywhere. You, you're stuck unless you have created all these other pathways around the boulder before the boulder even showed up. Then because you learned how to podcast, that taught you actually how to be really comfortable on mic. And then because you were comfortable on mic, they, you got more uh, appearances at conferences. And while you were at a conference, once you were speaking on a panel and you met this other person who was also a panelist and they introduced you to this person and now you're doing that, job, right? Like you just can't plan for that stuff. And so the more that we can just build into our lives, this constant addition of things that are available to us that are just interesting to us and nobody's asking us to do and we don't even know why it's going to pay off. The more that we can do that, the more that we are creating the option of resilience for ourselves. And that, I think, is something that we can fall back upon when we feel that panic. When we say, oh no, I've lost access to this one way of doing something, but wait a second, I have this other thing where I met this other person and I can explore that too. FOMO. You know, Jason, last week I was talking to a venture capitalist who's a friend of mine who's been on the show a couple of times, Beth Ferreira. She's mm -hmm. at a firm called First Park here in New York City. And we were talking about, you know, it's a little crazy right now in the world, right? We have an economic change happening. Like there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. And she, she commented this to me, which I thought was very insightful, which beautifully aligns with what you said. She said, I have determined that the most important superpower is basically reinvention. Mm -hmm. It's like we all have to be Miles Davis and Madonna in our careers. And the way that you do that is exactly that. You're like, you're, you're building the skills that allow you to navigate in ways that you may not even know yet. Yeah. But it is so true. And if you just kind of stay static in what you're doing, you're going to be really, it's kind of like you're going to be stuck on the same tracks and unable to move forward when something changes. And for that reason, you should see moments of disruption as an opportunity because it forces you outside of that comfort zone. If it, it, you know, we, we do this crazy thing, which I, I, I should take it back. It's not that crazy. It's completely understandable. We have to filter. We have to filter for opportunities, for ideas, for things that we are going to spend our time on. We cannot do everything, simply not possible. And so we have to make these decisions. What is good, what is bad, what is possible, what is impossible, what is going to carry me forward and what's going to set me back. And we build this little barrier around ourselves. And then when crisis, large or small, change, large or small comes along, one of the things it does is it invalidates or inhibits the things that we had put inside of our little box. Right. And, and and suddenly the things that we know to be true, the things that we have become most comfortable with, the things that we had decided were the good ideas, they don't work as well anymore. And we are forced to step outside. And I don't mean this in some kind of cliche, like step outside the box, but I mean, literally, we're forced mm -hmm. to now consider ideas that we had previously discarded. We had said, this is not going to work. I'm not interested in this. And instead, you have to go back to them. And sometimes you discover that those, in fact, are the greatest opportunities. I saw it over and over again during the pandemic. I'm sure you did too, where people reinvented their businesses often by doing things that they had thought about before but thought were impossible. And then they had to do it. They had to reconsider the impossible. And in so doing, they discovered, and in fact, much better way to operate, a way that was better for them, that led to more growth, that was a better service to their customers, it's 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 shocking. And the thing that we should learn from this is not, well, great, 
let's just wait for the next crisis. But rather, we have the ability to do that at any time. You don't actually have to wait for a crisis to build a little door inside of your fence that you have built around yourself to let new ideas in, to explore, to step outside and say, you know what, maybe I need to run some experiments. Maybe I don't know as much as I think I do about the business that I'm running or the people that I'm serving. And the more that we challenge our knowing problem, the problem that we think we know too much, the more that we challenge that, the more we discover that there are, in fact, so many great things that we were too short-sighted to take seriously. So we talked about how we start with panic and move to adapt. Mm -hmm. Talk about the new normal because that part, you know, it's tricky. Like, I don't even know. Are we in a new normal right now? Maybe, maybe we are not. It's like the world is spinning so fast. So what does that stage look like? I think that that's the most dangerous stage. And the reason for that is because we crave familiarity and we we crave comfort. And after being forced out of some kind of familiar, comfortable role and change comes and we panic and then we're forced to adapt whether we like it or not, the thing that we want desperately to do is to rebuild, to say, ah, now I know. Now I know how, how it is or how it should be. Or now, now this is the new way, which, which is, I think, by the way, how you get like these kind of silly cultural conversations where, where people are like, well, this is the new way that we're working. Now we're all doing this. <laughs> no, we're not. Right? We're one or two years into a complete rethinking. It's going to shift 14,000 times. You can't know. But we all want to know. We want to know so desperately that we start to say, aha, this is it. I have this. And I, I, I think that what we really need to, what we really need to do is we need to recognize that there, even when we have some sense of familiarity, familiar, familiarity, even when we feel like we've solved one problem through our adaptation, that there is still a ways to go. And it's going to be through really deeply considering what it is that we have and what it is that we know that other people don't. I'll give you a, give you a, a kind of nice little way of thinking about it. I was talking to um, Jim McKelvey, co-founder of Square, and he told me that when the Square Reader came out, right, it was uh, transformative. It enabled small businesses to take credit cards. They hadn't really been able to do that, or many of them hadn't been able to do that for, for, before for all sorts of reasons, too expensive infrastructure. And um, a lot of competitors saw this and immediately thought, aha, it's a great idea. We should go knock it off. And Jim said to me, people thought that the innovation was this device that you plug in to a, you know, an iPad or an iPhone. But really, it was these 14 other things that we had done in our innovation stack. I mean, they had, they had renegotiated uh, processing fees uh, with, with, with credit card processors. They, they had done all sorts of things. And people didn't see that. And as a result, they tried to knock Square off and they were unable to do so. And Jim said the really important thing to remember is that you need to know in any circumstance that you're in, when you're navigating a moment of change or you're creating that change yourself, what is your but really? He, what he just said there. People thought that the innovation was the device, but really it was these 14 other things that they had done. And we all have some kind of but really. I do this, but really I do that, right? I am going through this situation, but really it's teaching me how to navigate, uh, uh, you know, X, X, Y, Z thing. Um, I, I love the story of, I love the story of Lime. Um, do, 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 do you remember, do you remember when those scooters first, yeah. first came out? Do you remember how people reacted to them? I mean, I, I don't actually, because we never had them in New York, so I, yeah, I don't right, remember. Right, right, right. <laughs> the, the, the New York, the one place that really could use them, didn't have them, um, because, uh, uh, because it was so congested. Right. So, okay, so what happened was, a, you know, small, midsize, and, and, and some large cities uh, across the country suddenly had this, this, like, influx of these scooters, Lime, Bird, and uh, they were everywhere, and people were, like, freaking out about them, and they were, mm. they were calling them up. You know they're a nuisance and they're dangerous. And then there were a bunch of there were a bunch of accidents that got a lot of attention, where people were riding them and injured or killed. Terrible. And as a result, 
cities started banning them or threatening to ban them, or there's just a lot of talk about it. And, um, and so Lime, one of the leading companies, started to look into its data. Uh, to, to see if there was a, a real security problem because, you know, a safety issue. Because if there is, that that's something that we need to solve for, right? Um, and uh, and you could say, by the way, just to, just to kind of keep us on track with our paths, you could say that, that Lime had created a new normal. It liked its new normal. Drop these scooters off and, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and people use them and now we've got our new normal, we're off to the races, right? But there's a, there's a problem in that people are reacting very negatively to... Um, to, to, to these safety uh, issues and, you know, safety issues are bad. So anyway, Lime looks at it and um, they take a year's worth of data. They, they find that a very, very small fraction of rides resulted in any kind of accident. And most of those were minor scrapes, no big deal. And that when they looked at the number of serious accidents, it was, I think I could have this wrong, but I think it was 0.0011% of all accidents. And once they crunched those numbers, once they looked into all of those accidents, what they found was that the bulk of those accidents, of very serious accidents, happened during a rider's first five rides. So why am I telling you this story? Because here is a but really. It appears that this technology is unsafe. But really, it's an education problem. But really, what we need is to help people take their first five rides in a controlled environment so that they're comfortable with it, so that when they get out on the streets, they know how to use this thing a lot better. And so that's what that's what Lime did. They started to uh, hold these clinics where people could learn how to use these things and 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 get comfortable with them. Um, and uh, and and um, now, if you look at the data, uh, the scooters are not any more dangerous than any other form of urban transportation. Now. I think it's really powerful for us all in everything that we do when we're grappling with something to make a list of but reallys. Take a look at it. What does it look like on the surface? What do people outside see and what do you know? I do this, but really I do that. I created this, but really it's for this. The more that you have your but reallys, the more that you can identify how to go that extra mile. What is it? The, what is the thing that can push you not just from what seems obvious and what seems familiar, but towards a greater understanding of what you do and why you do it and what your value is to others, I think that's where you're in a position to really start to get out of the new normal, out of this sense of comfort, out of this thing of, well, I'm doing it and therefore it is good. And you can really start to challenge your assumptions and get to a place where you reach an even better stage where you say you wouldn't go back to the way it was before. All right, everybody. So the stages are panic, adapt, new normal, and wouldn't go back. And I'm not gonna, we're not going to get into that because we want you to read the book. So it's like a little cliffhanger. And the book is Build for Tomorrow by Jason Pfeiffer. You can find out more about Jason at his website, jasonpfeiffer.com. That's F-E-I-F-E-R or on Instagram at Hey Pfeiffer. Jason Pfeiffer, editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine and author of Build for Tomorrow. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you. This is a lot of fun. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMO Sapiens.com. FOMO.